We're in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. I want to begin this morning just simply by reading the text. Read along with me in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, I want to wait. That's okay. Thank you. I asked you to do it, so thank you. This is going to be our passage here now this morning, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh God, we pray that you would help us in the hearing of your perfect word, that you would help us be strengthened to have this mind as a church, that we would showcase the glory of Jesus in and through our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In 2001, actually almost 15 years ago, um, 16 years ago we started this uh, church in Tempe, 2001, a small group of people set off to plant a church in the heart of Tempe, and I was a part of that group, and there was actually a few from this church who were part of that group, and our hope and desire in, in starting this church was to see God save the lost from their sins. We went into the heart of the campus, the heart of uh, Arizona State University, and we set up every Sunday from scratch unloading our trailer in the Arizona heat in the afternoon, Sunday by Sunday. We reached out to our friends with the gospel. We saw God move through our unified efforts in this little church of plant of about 75 people that started grew to about 750 people in a year and a half. Many of those people came through conversion, through the spreading of the gospel and God's saving. And over a year and a half, we experienced, in many ways, great blessing. But in November of 2002, and it's literally almost 15 years ago to the weekend, over the course of a 10-day stretch, all of the elders of this church resigned, citing character issues with the senior pastor, who then subsequently resigned 10 days later. Two months prior to this moment, I got hired to be on staff at this church. I was 26 years old, and I essentially became the de facto leader of this 750-person church with no elders almost overnight. What happened next shaped my understanding of ministry forever. I watched as the body of believers that I loved and I treasured started to destroy itself. Backbiting and gossip and slander and factions arose in the church. And as I processed this with many friends, our church went from 750 people strong, pursuing Christ, pursuing the mission that we had together, down to 100 people in about six months. So let's recap. 75 to 750 to 100 in two years. Over the course of the next few years, uh, friendships were severed, marriages crumbled. I have some of my friends that walked away from Christ. And I learned through this experience that I learned to cherish the value of unity in the gospel through this. 
Every church has its challenges to be unified around the right things. And we have a great enemy whose name is Satan who knows that he cannot win the war against God and against his gospel and against his church, but he can make God's army confused and ineffective in his mission in the mission of the church. In fact, that's actually one of the reasons why Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi. If you flip over from where we are in chapter 2 and go to verse chapter 4 and look in verse 2, chapter 4, verse 2, Paul writes these words, I entreat Iodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. There is something about a collection of sinners who are working together to see God's glory manifested in their lives that brings God glory, big time glory. And that is why striving for unity in the church is so important. And so we're marching our way through this book we're in chapter 2, so you can flip back. How does a church become and continue to stay unified? What is the church called to rally around? And we're going to see in this text this morning that God doesn't call us to rally around a pastor. God doesn't call us to rally around a person. God doesn't call us to unify ourselves around a preference. God calls us to unify ourselves around a bloody cross. God calls us to unify our thinking around the cross of Jesus Christ. And we actually saw this two weeks ago when we studied verses 5 through 8, that our unity comes from the humility of being in Christ. That those who by faith are joined together in Christ as Christ goes into death and Christ is raised from the dead, we too are joined together with him by faith. And so we must walk in the same mindset as Jesus did when we saw that he became a nobody. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so we can say from the first part of the section that unity comes through the daily dying of self as we in Christ obey by his strength. And we stopped at verse 8. If we stop at verse 8 and we say, this is what unifies us, die like Jesus, there is no hope in that kind of unification. If we don't import anything else from the Bible into our understanding of unity, and we simply stop at verse 8, we don't understand the transcendent purpose for why we're to be unified. We don't understand the transcendent purpose for why we're to die daily to ourselves. We look at a picture of the cross and it appears to us as if it's complete ridicule and, and, and lunacy. Peter O'Brien writes the following about the cross. Now think about this. This is written to a group of believers in the first century who were, who were wrestling culturally with the, the death of Jesus Christ on a cross as their Savior. So this is what he says about crucifixion. He says, Crucifixion satisfied the primal lust for revenge and sadistic cruelty. It was usually associated with other forms of torture, including at least flogging. The criminal could be tortured to death for days in an unspeakable way. By first century standards, no experience was more loathsomely degrading than this. By first century standards, by any century standards. So, Christmas is around the corner. You're driving out to the outskirts of town. You're going to go to the mall, get in a little early Christmas shopping. And instead of seeing the storefronts on the side, you see people hanging from crosses, wailing and moaning, crying out to God to take their lives. That's the scene in this time. We don't have any way in our culture to comprehend the offensiveness of the cross. We wear crosses around our necks. Some people do in our culture, and they think that that is a statement of their identity. They wear it to show off their faith. F.F. F. Bruce says that in polite Roman society, the word cross was not to be uttered in conversation. It was an obscenity. And so if we're called to bear this cross, and that's all there is, and we don't understand the transcendent purpose of it, we're never going to understand why we should be humble and why we should unify around it. But Paul, as he continues to write, gives us 
more than just verse 8. He pulls back the cosmic curtain in verse 9, and we get a chance to see together this morning the cosmic purpose of the cross. We get to see the cross from a totally different view, not from the ground looking up at Jesus' suffering. We get to see from God's view looking down upon the cross from eternity and from heaven, and it's breathtaking. Verse 9 says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him. So we're going to see this morning two responses to the cross, which will help us unify ourselves around this cross so that the world will see the glory of Jesus in the church. First response to the cross, exaltation. God the Father highly exalts in what Jesus has done. The word therefore, as it turns in verse 9, indicates cause and effect. So, summary again, because Jesus left the glory of eternity and he humbled himself to become obedient and dependent in every moment to the point of death, even death on a cross, because of that humiliating, horrific moment in human history, God exalts Jesus highly. And so we must ask, what is it about the cross that is worthy of exaltation because this was not something to be spoken of in polite circles. The cross is worthy of exaltation because you and I and every other person who has ever lived has sinned against God. Now you might think, well, sin, that sounds like a big church word that pastors use. That's about murdering and stealing and raping. No, sin, those things are sinful, but sin is sin because it doesn't conform to the holiness of God. Whatever thought, whatever action, whatever attitude, whatever deed does not conform to the holiness of God. It is a rejection of God as the ruler of our lives. It's deciding that we know what's right, and God doesn't know what's right. And so if you think sin is not that big a deal, let me just point out that it took a cross to deal with it. It took a cross to to deal with it. It took a human being, Jesus in the flesh, to come and die in order to make right what we've done. If you put your sin against God on one side of the scale, and you put all the sins of all the people against you on the other side of the scale, and you try to weigh that out, your side of the scale, your sin against God, is so heavy, it it falls to the ground and breaks the concrete below. That's the way we are to understand the deep and personal offense against God that our sin brings. It is not a small thing. Sin has spread to all men through Adam, Romans 5.1, and sin brings the promise first of death and second of eternal judgment. And apart from divine rescue, that would be the result for anyone, everyone who has ever lived in every generation. And so this is a, <laughs> this is massive. How would God save us? How would God rescue us? He's not obligated to do anything except judge us. But in his beautiful mercy, he sends Jesus, his son, on a rescue mission. Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. Jesus makes himself a servant. He comes in the form of a baby. He is found in the likeness of man. He's born in the stench of animal dung and human sin. And he lives a life of perfect dependency and obedience to God the Father. As an example to follow, yes, but even more than that, as a substitute for us, because where he goes, we cannot go perfectly. And when Jesus dies on this cross, as horrific as it was, the physical pain, the greater pain was Jesus bearing the wrath of God for sins that he didn't commit, but sins that I committed and sins that you committed. And because of this cross, we see that because of this atonement on our behalf, God has highly exalted him. It's not because God delights in the evils of the cross. It's not because God delights in torture. It's not because he's an unloving God who enjoys pain. Catch this. He is a God who loves redemption. 
He loves what Christ has done. He approves of what Christ has done. He planned what Christ would do. And when God looks at the cross, he doesn't see shame. He sees salvation. He doesn't see weakness. He sees strength. He doesn't see foolishness. He sees wisdom, 1 Corinthians 1. His view from above, from heaven's perspective, from eternity past to the final exercise of the obedience of his son, his view is one of glowing approval. God loves his son, just like a parent loves their child. Parents love to brag about their children. Parents love to talk about how great their children are. I am one of those parents. (laughs) I brag about my children. I love when they do things in, in a manner that's pleasing to God. I love when they do awesome things. Taylor wrote a song over the last year. She played it actually on this stage for her school's talent show, and she won. It was an awesome moment. Trevor scored three touchdowns on the day of Nana's celebration of life. It was an awesome day. Riley made it to the finals of the Bard competition with a stirring rendition of Casey at the Bat. Lexi is queen of everything, and everyone knows it, and so we brag about our kids, and parents are obnoxious about their kids because they're just so darn proud of them. So imagine if that's us over these things. Imagine how God feels about his son who perfectly obeyed, who never sinned, and through his sufferings now accomplished the long-awaited plan of redemption. It's as if we read through verses 5 through 8, and there's a crescendo happening. And now in verse 9, it's as if God is bursting at the seams to say to the world, look at my son. Look at what he has done. Everything I gave him to accomplish, he did willingly. When you look at the cross and you see humiliation, this is what I see. I see delight and approval and rejoicing. It was no tragic accident or unfortunate consequence of a political rebellion that got out of hand or the effects of God falling asleep on the job. God had planned the cross before the foundation of the world was laid, Ephesians 1. The cross is not foolishness but wisdom, 1 Corinthians 1.18. And in one change of a verse we see that the cross of humiliation has become transformed into the cross of exaltation, and Christ will be exalted for all eternity as the Savior of sinners. That is great news for us. We see this in the book of Revelation. We see this picture. I want to read just this section. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. This is the picture of Jesus. A lamb standing as though it had been slain. With seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, listen to the song, Worthy are you to take the scroll And to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So how does this view of the cross begin to unify us? When we see the cross through God's eyes as the place of judgment for our sins, as the endless source of forgiveness, we realize that everything we have and everything we are flows from his mercy that comes to us from this cross. For the church, our whole lives are meant to echo God's song of exaltation. The way you drive your car to work is meant to exalt in the mercy of this cross. The way you prepare dinner is meant to exalt the mercy of this cross. The way you work through conflict with a friend is meant to exalt the mercy of this cross. The way you carefully listen to your clients is meant to exalt the mercy of this cross. 
The way you willingly share your stuff is meant to exalt the mercy of this cross. This is what we unify around, the cross of mercy of Jesus Christ. You don't deserve it, and neither do I. But as we go down into its path, we find that the way up is down, and the way down is really up. As the curtain gets pulled back farther and we get another window into the majesty of the cross, we see that not only is Christ the exalted Savior, he's crowned as King of kings and Lord of lords. So second response to the cross is coronation. We have exaltation and coronation. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. So not only is he our Savior, but he's been given a new title, a new designation. He's been given a name above every other name, and that name is what? You might be thinking, Jesus. I mean, look right there. It says the name above every name, so that the name of Jesus. But that's not the fullness of it. The name above all other names that's bestowed upon Jesus is the result of the work of the cross. Obedient to the point of death on a cross, therefore God gives him the name. His name was Jesus at his incarnation. So what is the name that's given to Jesus because of the cross? It is the name, it is the title that carries with it authority. It is the name that will cause all things in heaven and on earth and under the earth to bow their knees. Who alone has this name? It is God. And Philippians 2, Paul is picking up on Isaiah 45, verses 22 and 23, when Isaiah writes this. Listen to the language which Paul picks up. As he is speaking here, as he's writing this, from the language of God, Yahweh. Verse 22, it says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. So who are they bowing to in Isaiah? They're bowing to Yahweh. Who are they swearing allegiance to in Isaiah? They're swearing allegiance to Yahweh. Who will they bow before and swear allegiance to in Philippians chapter 2? Jesus Christ. How can these two things be the same? Because the name that is above all names that Jesus Christ has earned through his humiliation at the cross is the very title that Yahweh God possesses himself. The name, the title, Lord. Kurios. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Isaiah 45. The approval that God the Father has in the atonement of the cross is seen, and then it gives Jesus his very own title as the Lord of the worlds. Doesn't that just turn everything upside down? That the one who hangs in humiliation, the one who's being mocked by soldiers, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself, is weak and has no power In their eyes, he's nothing more than a pacifist who makes audacious claims and causes problems. He's a nobody who is a slave, but that slave has become the Lord. See, Jesus has never been out of power. His time of humiliation on the cross was actually his coronation ceremony. When they placed the crown of thorns on his head, it was really a kingly crown. Jesus was sworn into office with the words, it is finished. The nobody has become somebody. The slave has become the Lord. And now Jesus has dominion over every single person and city and nation in the world, including you. He has regained what has always been rightfully his. Peter O'Brien again says, Jesus has achieved the same lordship the same status with his father over the whole broken universe. Not because there was no sense in which he had it 
before, but because he now achieves it for the first time as the God-man, as the crucified and risen Redeemer. Jesus is the Lord. It's become popular over the last few decades to wear T-shirts, talk about Jesus, and have bumper stickers about Jesus and about God, like God is my homie, and treating Jesus as if he's a kid brother to us. Jesus is not your co-pilot. He is the Lord of the world. All will bow their knees before this Jesus. There are two massive implications to this for us as a church. First, Jesus is ultimately in charge, which means Jesus calls the shots, which means you're freed from your sin not to keep sinning. You're freed from your sin to follow him, and you're freed to obey. Slaves to sin, now slaves to righteousness. That means that if you are a Christian, then you joyfully embrace his lordship. That means you're striving to do what the king says. There should be no genuine servant of the king whose attitude should be, how much can I get away with that the king won't see? It should be, what is the will of the Lord? And so we scour the scriptures to hear the Lord speak, and we tune our ears to listen to his voice, and because he first loved us in the gospel, freeing us to love, we then obey. Jesus is in charge. And maybe you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, it doesn't look like Jesus is in charge over all the world because things are messed up. Things are broken. There's suffering. There's trials. There's difficulties. And you wonder if Jesus is really there in power. He is. He is not weak as some suppose. The cross has vindicated him in that regard. But sin has not yet been fully displaced. And so that means that we will face dark hours. But the Lord knows all that's happening and watches over his children with a watchful eye and with his loving providence. Even now as Jesus rules and reigns, he's still within his private chambers. He's not yet been presented to the, to the fullness of his kingdom as the ruler. Not everyone knows his rule yet. And so some follow and some are hostile, but here's what our text says this morning, and this has bearing on every one of us. There will be a day when Jesus comes forth to that platform, and all attention around all the world will be on him, and everyone will immediately recognize him as the king, and they will fall down on the ground at his very presence this is the view we get of this day, that Christ has been made king through the cross. Not everyone knows it yet, but one day he will return to this earth. And the text says that those in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth, those who are in the heavenly places, those who have died, those who are alive on earth, everyone will submit to his lordship on that day. It's all-encompassing. Every Every knee will bow. It's not like everyone will bow except you and your three friends over here. No. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on that final day. There will be no confusion as to who is in charge. King Caesar is not the Lord. Donald Trump is not the Lord. The economy is not the Lord. Your boss that hates Christianity is not the Lord. Jesus Christ alone has this title, the Lord. And if you are his, if you are in Christ, he will uphold you and protect you and sustain you. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of Christ Jesus, the Lord. You can say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He will bring us across that finish line. He will bring us to the place of glory. And the second implication is this, Jesus will bring judgment and reward. Judgment and reward. This text is both comforting and frightening. It's comforting because we as Christians, we know the end of the story. We know how it turns out. We know that Christ is in charge. We know that weakness really is a place to showcase God's strength. We know that no matter what we face, no matter what the cost, we know Christ will right all wrongs. We will ultimately receive the reward of Christ's exaltation. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. 
For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Oh, that's a great promise. Oh, that's such a good promise. Blessed is that man. But it's also frightening because not everyone in this picture is bowing their knee from their own volition. Not everyone who confesses Jesus as Lord on the last day will do it as a follower. One commentary said this, the text promises that Jesus has the last word, that he is utterly vindicated, that in the end no opposition against him will stand. There will not be universal salvation. You know, salvation through death. There will not be universal salvation. There will be universal confession as to who he is. That means, oh please listen, that means that either we repent and confess him by faith as Lord now, or we will confess him in shame and terror on the last day. But confess him we will. This is perhaps the most incredible panoramic view of them all. We see the final picture, Christ exalted as Savior and Christ crowned as Lord. But on the final day, we'll see the scope, the full scope of what the cross, cross has accomplished. It is universal acknowledgement of Jesus as the Lord. And so maybe you're here this morning and maybe you've heard about Jesus but you've ignored him or you've marginalized him and he doesn't have a place in your life. Maybe you've, maybe you've considered Jesus to be like the thing that the religious people do, the, the crutch for the weak people to lean on. You have no interest in him. Maybe you claim the name of Christ and yet you don't live as if Jesus is actually in charge of your life. You just live the way you want to live and by your life deny the fact that you actually know Jesus. And I'm here to plead with you this morning on the basis of Philippians chapter 2 that there is a day coming and it cannot be stopped. The only question is whether or not you're going to bow your knee now in joyful submission, receiving all of the eternal benefits, or later in awe of his holiness and authority as he judges you for your sin. And Paul, by the word of God, is eager for you to take the first option. I'm eager for you to take the first option. Put your faith in Christ. So how does this unify a local church? The church that is in Christ puts on display the glory of God's redemption as we go down, as we go low in our humility so that many in the world would see God's power and would be saved and Christ would be exalted. As we go down, Christ is lifted up. That's how the king's cross gets exalted in this world. Through the church, going low so that God may be lifted high. You know, I've thought about that church plant a lot in the last 15 years. And by God's grace, that church still exists. God persevered that church down to 100 people, no pastor, no real experienced leadership. God persevered that church, and that church is a force for good in the East Valley still. Friends with the pastor and I reflected upon that time, and I, and I reflected upon what God did in that time. I didn't set out to be a pastor. God used that, that experience in my life to change me. I didn't set out to have a life goal to plant a church. I didn't start out hoping to become a Christian. I was probably voted most least likely of my class to be a Christian in high school. I didn't start out hoping that these things would happen, and neither did you. And God, in his mercy through this cross, scooped us up and put us into this thing called the church, which is meant to show the world God's grace to a sinful people by going down the path, because the path down is the way up. And as we as a church continue to abide in Christ, we continue to press into this selfless, Jesus-like humility that puts others first 
the joy of salvation will spread from this place like a wildfire to a world that longs to be consumed by it and doesn't even know. There is a mission and a purpose for the gospel that continues even to this day. The path up is through the way down. Oh God, we pray this morning in the hearing of your word that you would take whatever is good and profitable and press it into us, Lord. I care, Lord, about these people. I want those who don't know you to be rattled this morning at the coming of Jesus as Lord. I want them to question what they're doing in their lives if it's not following you. And I want you to shake us up who claim the name of Christ and to search our hearts. Are we living in a manner worthy of this gospel? Are we pursuing you? Are we repenting for our sins? Are we humble? Are we really showcasing the glory that you want to shine through us? Lord, you'll use this word in every one of our lives differently. I pray that as we come now to a time of communion that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.